Hi everybody, Steve from Steve's Makerspace. Today we are going to be talking about art composition for generative artists. For most of the video I'll be showing examples of art and talking about the different elements that are present in that art. Towards the end of the video I'll go over a few code examples of how I'm implementing these composition elements into the art. A lot of the composition rules don't necessarily apply to all generative art, uh, like this piece right here. It does follow a rule of unification and harmony, but a lot of the other rules for composition just don't apply to a piece like this. By the way, all the things I'm going to be showing you are things either that I've collected and I own, this one is by VGA, uh, or things that I made myself. Here's another one, this one by me, uh, that doesn't really follow any composition rules. Uh, the composition just takes up the entire canvas, although it does have flow. One thing you might think about when you're doing a composition is what sort of emotion you want to convey. And this one, I think, conveys excitement, happiness maybe. Uh, definitely not depression. This piece by me, I think, is about hope and excitement and joy. Another thing this brings out is the idea of main objects. So this has one main object to it. Whereas this piece by Oxmal Funk has four objects to it. I would say this flower right here is probably the main object and perhaps uh, this object and this object are the balancing objects. If you did not have these objects up here, you just had the flowers down here, it might seem unbalanced. Uh, putting this sun in the sky uh, gives it a sense of balance. There's also positive and negative space. So this has some positive space here. This sky is more of a negative space and another thing to point out about this piece is you've got a background you've got a foreground and you also in this piece i think have a middle ground with these mountains so you might think about the role of your background and your foreground you want the focus to be on these main objects and this background perhaps provides some contrast perhaps it helps to bring out the main object. Here's Neo Supremus number one by Gorilla Sun. Uh, this one also has positive and negative space. There is a main object and I would say that this black mark is the secondary object. These rectangular objects around here could be considered a motif. It's a repeating pattern. That's another technique that artists use. Sometimes it's called rhythm. This being placed in a diagonal kind of creates a little excitement. There's uh, something about diagonals that are more exciting than horizontal and vertical lines. If we look at Gorilla Sun's project page for this, uh, I'll point out to you that almost all of them, I think all of them have a circle as the main object, and all of them have either a black or sometimes a white line and I think that makes it a secondary object. I might also point out the location of this is directly in the center. That's not usually recommended. Uh, usually you talk about the thirds, but having something directly in the center is usually considered spiritual. I know that Kandinsky often uh, put things right in the center. All the Bauhaus people often put things in the center because they were spiritual people. They were expressing their spirituality through their art. Here's another example of mine where I've drawn in some thirds lines so you can see these points. For Radiant, my main object is always on one of these thirds points. And I also have these thick lines, and these thick lines are crossing at one of the thirds points. The most pleasing spot to put something is on one of these thirds points, although you could place an object along the thirds line or along the thirds horizontally. Here's what this piece looks like without those thirds lines. Now this piece by me has two main objects and you can see that the tree is sort of presenting the sun or perhaps praising the sun. The tree has some obvious pull to it because it's unusual. It's not like anything else on the page. It's also black. Another thing I mentioned, the thirds, this tree is roughly in the thirds area. Um, 
this is not quite the thirds. This is like up and around the fourth, although this is about the thirds uh, here. Here's another radiant piece that is placed on the thirds point. Uh, another thing to point out about this is the background. It is desaturated. The main object has a fair amount of saturation to the colors, whereas the background has very little saturation. That is a technique to emphasize the main object. There is also some blurring that I do to the background. Mostly this is to get rid of some of the hard lines that are created during the drawing of the background, uh, but it also helps to emphasize the main object. I don't like to use blurring too much because I think it looks bad. Here's one of my order of things, which does not really follow any of the composition rules I'm gonna talk about, but contrast this with this one, which is also the order of things. But for this one, where does your eye go first? Where does your eye go second? Where does your eye go third? I'm gonna guess that it first went here, and then it went down over here, and then it went over here. Uh, so that's on purpose. This is the main object. I'm gonna have a large item that only appears once. I'm gonna have some mid-size objects that only appear a few times, and those are the secondary objects, and then the rest of the objects are sort of a background. This is my Bauhaus. Here is an example of balance. I've got main object here, secondary object over here, and then some items here. Um, if I only had this and didn't have anything over here, it might not be balanced. So having this over here provides some balance. Another composition technique is to bring focus to the main object, and that can be done with guiding lines. So in this one, the lines are going straight through the center of my main object. And so these lines are directing your attention to that main object. This by Max Generous is a good example of guiding lines, except that instead of guiding you to a main object, it's guiding your eye around the entire canvas. So notice that it doesn't really bleed off the canvas a, a little bit here, but mostly it stays on the canvas. Looks like it's coming off the canvas over here, but really it looks more like it's coming into the canvas, like this is your entry point to the piece. And if we look at the project page for this, you'll see that most of the objects are centered around the middle of the canvas and don't really go off the edge very much. You want your viewer's attention to stay on the canvas, not necessarily in one spot. You could guide them around the canvas, but you don't want to guide them off the canvas. Another way to focus on a main object is with framing. Uh, this obviously frames this main object here. This one also has some guiding lines going towards the main object. Here's a piece by me down the rabbit hole which shows a couple of things. One is a motif. Uh, you've got a, quite a few circles here that are repeating. There's also some balance here where this part of the picture is balanced with this over here. Here's Cosmology of Oneself by Dead Code. And what I would point out here is that it's almost in the thirds. It's not quite on a thirds point but it is kind of in a thirds line right here the center is right here it is following that rule here's a piece of mind that doesn't follow the thirds i've got an object directly in the center uh, so this is more of a spiritual piece here's my radiant again and with this one i want to point out the very center here you can really drawn to this yellow center because I only use that color sparingly. It's an accent color. There's a 60-30-10 rule, which doesn't get used by artists very much who are doing paintings, but it is used in websites, graphic designs, movies, and it can be used in art. So the 60 is the 60% of the background, which is desaturated. The 30% is the main object colors that are going to be used and the 10 percent is the accent color that's what i've got here in the center so the accent color is used sparingly 
Often it's a yellow or a red, but it could be any color. In this mandala by Sean Kemp, the accent color is a white, although it, you could say it's used just as much as all the other colors, but it is very bright compared to the other colors. It really stands out. Now I'm showing you this piece, not because I think it's excellent. I think it's kind of a mess, actually. Uh, but I want you to know that I don't always get it right and that I'm learning how to do this stuff and it takes practice. So uh, yes, I have a main object, but the rest of this is like, where are you supposed to put your eye? I don't know. It's just kind of a mess. Um, here's another one down the rabbit hole where, yes, I've got this motif here of squares across the top, but it's a mess. It's, it's too far up. It's a work in process trying to figure this stuff out. This is an excellent example of what not to do for unity and harmony. This is not unified and harmonious. For harmony, you want individual parts working together. Uh, unity is about oneness. The art feels complete. The style is the same throughout. The work appears finished and the parts work together. Not so much with this piece. This piece by Sean Kemp. Yes, harmonious, unified, definitely. Same with this one by Dead Code, this piece by Max Generous, this one by Gorilla Sun, and this by VGA. And I sometimes pull off unity and harmony. I want to highlight this guy, David Kessler Fine Art. He's got a YouTube channel um, that I will link to, but he's got classic design compositions that he's either come up with or just simplified cruciform form radiating so obviously my radiant is using the radiating form uh, horizontal lines he's got vertical lines diagonal lines uh, there's balance and unbalanced and then group mass uh, curvilinear which is just circles and then a three spot triangle so you might take a look at this see if it's helpful Another video I'm going to point you to is this composition and art. Uh, he's going to talk about a lot of the things I've talked about, but I think it's going to be helpful for you to hear somebody else talk about uh, these things and to see more examples. So getting into the code now, uh, here is an example of how I'm choosing the thirds spot. Uh, it's just width divided by three or width divided by three times two and the same with the height. Uh, if you wanted to, you could vary this. If you didn't want it to be exactly on that spot, you could say plus or minus uh, some random number. And we're saving that information into a couple of variables for the width and the height. This is my radiant code. Now, if I switch over to my Bauhaus code, I had secondary objects. I'm not going to go over all of this code, but basically I'm looking at the width of my main object and having the width of the second object be somewhat smaller than the main object. I'm also looking at the X and Y position of the main object and putting the secondary object in the opposite section of the canvas from that main object, but also considering uh, what's the size of my second object and how much room do I have. If I don't have enough room to put that second object on the canvas, then I'm not going to put the second object on the canvas. So lots of calculations here, checking to see if I have enough room for that second object. Now returning to my radiant code, uh, for guiding lines, uh, you could translate to your main object, uh, rotate some amount, then uh, this is for a straight line, you just make the line uh, longer than your canvas because if it's going to be rotated at an angle, uh, you need to make sure it's not just the height of the canvas, but it's more than the height. Now you could, of course, have a guiding line that just starts at that object and then radiates out. Or you could even have a short guiding line that isn't even at that point, but is a little farther away, but points to the object. You could also make a second object, such as a triangle that is pointing to your main object. And of course, you could also have a guiding line that is curving, but is starting that curve near your main object. Lots of possibilities. 
But all of that starts by translating to your main object position, rotating, and then drawing from that. For motifs or repeating patterns, right now I'm looking at my Truchet hex tiling, and you can see repeating patterns here and here. And this is using Perl and Noise to decide what type of shape I'm going to be drawing in particular spots. So I'm going through my X and Y positions. I'm getting a noise value. Then down here, I'm determining a curve type based on that noise value. And then I draw different curves from that curve type. But down the rabbit hole, the way I was creating a repeating pattern was simply that there was a high percentage that the shape type would be the same as the shape type that already exists. For that blurring effect I talked about, you can see that it's a very small amount of blur, only 0.3. For my radiant piece, I used the 60-30-10 rule. What I started out with was a five color palettes, and I decided that I wanted seven colors. Uh, three of the colors are for background, three colors are for the main object color, and a last color is an accent color. And they're all in the same position. The last color is always the accent color, and the first three are always the background color. It's hard to find seven color palettes, which is why mostly I had to convert five color palettes into seven colors. Now you could just take your five color palette and say, okay, I'm gonna, uh, using the code, desaturate some of these colors. You might try subtracting 50, or you might try replacing the saturation part with a different number like 30. This light blue color here is these three numbers here, and then the green are these three numbers. So this middle number here is the saturation. So you can see this is uh, saturation 30, this is saturation 25. Now with blues and greens, you can desaturate these quite a bit, and they still look like blues and greens. With reds and oranges, you cannot desaturate those very much and expect them to still look red and orange. This red down here, that's this 100 is the saturation of the red. If I pull that down to 30, you can see it doesn't look red at all. It looks a uh, very light pink. So I have to get this all the way up to about 70 before it starts to look like red. And with the oranges, even worse. That's number three. Okay, here's number four. And right now it's at 120 saturation. If I bring that down to 30, it looks like this. Uh, even if I bring it up to 70, it's starting to look orange. But at 50, it doesn't really look orange. So what you might do if you're going to replace the saturation uh, because you want to use it for a background, maybe if it's red or orange, saturate it around 70. And if it's any other color, you can saturate it around 30. For your accent color, I would make that fairly bright and fairly saturated. Unless your accent color is black. So that's going to do it for this video. I would highly encourage you to watch other videos about composition and spend some time looking at really good generative art and try to figure out what composition techniques they're using that makes that art so good. And then spend some time thinking about how you can implement those techniques in your code when you're making your art. One other thing, I will be doing an NFT sale of my Radiant project on FX Hash very soon. I'll pin a comment to this video with the information about that sale. If you like this video, please give it a like, consider subscribing to the channel, ring the bell for notifications, comments. I really would love to hear your comments on this video in particular, especially if you have some other ideas about composition. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye now. Steve's Makerspace.